Hello and welcome to the Out of Spec podcast. I'm joined by my friend Michael Hughes, who some of you may already know if you watched our huge charge point in-depth video where I went over to the offices and met with yourself and all of your colleagues and we had a blast. So Michael, thanks so much for joining on this quick episode to talk about NAX. Good to be with you, Kyle. Thanks. Yeah. So um, one of the things we talked about when I was visiting you guys at uh, your headquarters in California was just like the insane engineering effort that you put into your hardware. You have unbelievable software where I was blown away because you have basically have one software stack that runs on all of your charging equipment. It self configures based on what's put into it. I mean, some of the most next gen charging stuff that I've ever seen. And then, you know, the one thing that I was like, when I was there, I'm like, well, how can you charge a Tesla natively without the use of adapters? And not only now, you know, since then, we've seen automakers like Ford, GM, Mercedes, now BMW, and so on. And pretty much everyone, except Volkswagen Group and Toyota, but they'll switch soon, has gone to the North American charging standard, which is the Tesla plug. And today you guys have some news to share. So what's going on over on your world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, and I, I think um, it's interesting, right? I mean, we've been in a multi-connector world forever. You've been living with this too, right? We have Chatamo, we've had CCS, we've had a NAX, well, although it probably wasn't called NAX back then, but a Tesla connector as well. And so we've been living in this multi-connector world, and now it looks like we're going to be there for a few more years, right? So I think eventually, and I hope you, I think you and I both agree, like eventually let's get to one place where there is a common connector that everybody uses, but with, you know, every two, every Tesla since 2012 out there with an X connector, and then now GM, Ford, others, you're going to add that, we're going to have a multi-connector world. So what we're doing is we're saying, um, for private use, which is largely our CPH, the home product, and the CPF, which is you know a fleet product, um, you can buy a connector today, right? So you can say, hey, look, I'm ordering my home unit. I want an axe connector, good to go. I'm ordering a, a fleet unit. I want an axe connector, good to go. You can even, on the fleet unit, which has two ports, you can have one NAX and one CCS, right? And as an example, this is what that looks like, right? So here's your Here's your NAX connector, ChargePoint logo on the side, fully enabled, uh, and will deliver all the services and capabilities of the CPF or the CPH, right? Uh, and then in the public charging world, right? So this is AC charging, as you know, with the CP6000, which is a 50 amp or 80 amp product. Um, again, similar. You can, you can order today a NAX connector or a CCS connector. And if you already have any of these any of this equipment, you can order a conversion kit and we can get you a conversion kit and you can flop uh, one cable for another. That uh, is fascinating. So, so but, the but I know you, charge. but I know you care about DC Kyle, yes. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, so in the DC world, the same applies to the products that you've been charging on the CP two fifties. You can order a, a NAX connector for that. You can also offer a conversion kit and take out a Chatamo and put in a in a NAX connector. And then on the PL1000, which is connected to the uh, the Express Plus power block, right, which is delivering the high power charging, uh, you can also provide a NAX connector to that. So again, I know you're going to ask this, so let me preempt that is 200 amp on the 250 and 350 amp on the PL1000 for the Express Plus. Okay, cool stuff. If you were a really, I would say, adventurous CPE 250 owner, let's say there's some private owners who have them installed for public use, could you retrofit that 350 amp cable to that so you could get the full 120 kilowatts out of it? You can retrofit the 200 amp cable on the 250. Okay, so 200 amp, 250, 350 amp for the higher power versions. Um, can you talk to me what that process looks like? Can you share any expected costs? First of all, for the home unit, I think is probably the most directly related to our users. For example, a good friend of mine has your ChargePoint home unit. Uh, we're very familiar with that unit. I know so many of our viewers have them. Um, and a lot of them have Tesla vehicles existing with the NAC sport. So yep. how does that retrofit work? How much does it cost? I just went through this across the street. It's really simple. Don't need an electrician. You can actually undo the holster. If you've seen the, I don't have one with me, but if you've seen the holster, undo the holster, pop in the new holster, and then and then the cable attaches, and it's less than 200 bucks. So you can flop it out and never have to use your adapter again. 
That um, is worth every penny right there. You just buy the new cable. I love that you don't need an electrician to do it because you guys have all those pressure fittings for everything anyway. So that's yep. you know zero risk. That's the move. And we should do a story on that. We should swap one of the cables and talk about how that works. Yeah, I mean, on the CP6000, I don't know if I, if, I don't, if I remember when you were here when we did this, but on the CP6000, which will be the AC standard unit across America in workplaces and municipalities and all kinds of stuff, it's four screws. Four screws, it's magnetically connected. You pop it off, pop it back on. It says, oh, where am I connected to? I'm connected to a CP6000. This is how I operate. Good to go. So that's about six minutes. Um, and on the CP250, uh, we're having some internal races right now. We're down to about 18 minutes, but it's probably should plan on a half hour. <laughs> That's incredible. I love that. And, you know, I think it comes down to, we also have a lot of existing leaf owners watching this podcast and our viewers, and I own an old leaf as well. So, you know, sort of this death of Chatamo, if you will, we, the writing's been on the wall for years, but I think it's kind of time to rip the bandaid. I'm not sure if that means we should remove existing Chatamo infrastructure or just, uh, keep as much there as possible and build new NACs and CCS dual connectors. Does ChargePoint have an opinion? Obviously, you guys are just selling the equipment, but do you have a direction you're trying to steer everyone to go here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we agree on the long-term settle point, which is going to be a NACs cable primarily, right? What we don't think is fair to hosts is to try to decipher how many vehicles are going to show up of what type make sure they have enough parking spots for everyone it's just that's not a game that they should be playing so we will solve the whatever car pick pulls up you can charge on that right and it'll pull up and it'll have whatever it'll know your car and it'll enable you to charge it'll pull out the right cable for you you know, in, you know, as you as you go to charge. So that's coming. I'm not going to steal the thunder from what's coming. There's more more news here that I think everyone's going to be excited about. But in the meantime, you're right. What, what are we doing with Chatamo? I think we agree that the long term settle point is uh, is probably on Nax, and and that's great. It'll take us five to ten years to get there, right? By the time they put it in the vehicles and all those kinds of things. So, and then we'll have a mixed world for a while. So where does Chatamo go? Well. Funding some of the grants, and you even talked about this in your podcast the other day, like some of the grants are tied to having access to the Nissan Leaf owners and all that stuff. So we'll have to manage through that process. And so each site host will have to have the choice, right? It, am I, do I meet the obligations of the grant by having both Chatamo and CCS today? Does that change over time to be determined? But I suspect for the, uh, in ever decreasing number of Chatamo connected vehicles will end up with a CCS and NAX for a while and then eventually all NAX. Do you think there's ever a world, and I know you know this better than I do, essentially not to get super nerdy, but Chatamo and CCS slash NAX, CCS and NAX communicate the same way. Chatamo communicates an entirely different way. Do you think we'll ever see an adapter to bring a Chatamo to CCS or Chatamo to NAX? I, I saw you mention that the other day. I, I, I don't know. I, we've got a standards team that spends a ton of, ton of time working on this. I don't know. I think there's a path. Um, I don't know if the, the, the market out there is big enough to make that somebody's, you know, an important project, right? Like, you know, a, an ever decreasing amount of Chatamo vehicles. So how important is that in the overall? I don't know. Yeah. And I, and I'm offending every leaf owner I know, <laughs> you included. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. I, I'm with you. I totally agree. I mean, my my opinion, selfishly, is I have other. I don't road trip my leaf. It actually lives with my friends in California. I've only driven it a few times, but you know, I did get it as a way to at least try and understand what these early leaf owners are going through. And honestly, this car represents some of the underpaid population or or population with not a ton of money to upgrade to a CCS vehicle, essentially. Yep. So I do think there is there has to be some way to keep those vehicles going on the road so we have cheap electric vehicles that you know everyone can easily afford to buy. But on a different topic, let's get back into the NAC situation. Um, I have to ask you the question, and I've asked you this a million times, why the 200 amp limit on the CPE 250? Not to get super technical, but was there a decision in the, the higher you know, realm of charge point to say, let's not go big power cables. Was it a cost decision? What came to this? 
you know, no, we will get there, right? So on PL2, we'll get to 375. So on the on the on the power link, so with the with the full power uh, cabinet behind it, we'll get to 375 and then boost to 400, right? We'll get to 500 amp liquid cool, uh, more 600 amp liquid cool. We're going to get there for all the high powered charging applications. Um, it, for us, it's really a matter of servicing the customers that we have today and making sure that they have a path going forward in the most timely manner. I mean, I, like, like I love all the next stuff that's happening, but it puts customers, meaning station hosts, in a bad spot, right? And they got to go, I got to go choose how many vehicles of different types show up and what do I do? What we've tried to say, and, and maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. What we've tried to say is, look, d- don't worry about it, right? Serve all vehicles from one parking spot. And uh, and then we will enable you in a very simple conversion to get to the right place. High power charging, all of those things will largely be in a power block, as you know, uh, PowerLink 1000, PowerLink 2000 scenario. So we're going to spend time getting that high powered burst charging, all of that going for that. And the 250, which serves a great use case, right? You see it every day. Convenience stores go in and grab a sandwich. All of that kind of stuff will, you know, will continue to get, um, you know, faster and faster, right? We're going to do more and more. But the cable choice, and you know this, the cables are uh, a bit of the hard part of this business right now, and we're working with partners and and trying to enable that to get better. So, is the next? Uh- you have two options, of course, the 200 amp, the 350 amp. Is it the same end connector or they have different designs on them? Because I saw some photos, the press photos, and it like looks like a NAX connector, but it looks weird and different than the Tesla one. What's what's going on there? Yeah, so so we've developed it all in-house, right? And um, and I, I, we'll have to have Hussein or somebody on to go through what's the specific differences. That's not my domain. But um, we developed all in-house um, you know, and it gives us some, you know, obviously the modularity benefits, you know, we can recognize it. It can talk to each other. We can even sense when a cable's broken so you can go fix it before customers have a bad experience. So we're trying to enable that. Um, but it, the specific cable difference between the 350 amp and the 200, I can't tell you. No, that's fine. But it's cool to know that you guys designed and developed that in-house. Obviously, you have a contract manufacturer who's building it for you. I, I don't think you guys are putting the cables together yourselves, right? Correct. Okay, cool. But either way, I mean, that's that's the charge point cable. And that's sort of the magic of where you guys have been almost the best in the industry. Obviously, you do way more than hardware, but one of your hardware key advantages have been the charge point engineered cables. When you don't go out and buy Rima cables or Phoenix Contact or whoever, when you have your own cable, like for the charge point home units, they are next level. You guys really build some of the best user experience hardware. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we spend so much time on user experience. You don't get paid for that typically, but those of us who live in this world really appreciate it. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, and, and again, all of these products going through all the testing labs and, you know, sand and dust and all that other stuff. So we're trying to build stuff to last. Um, and and I think that will pay off for consumers. Um, you know, I mean, you, you've seen this, right? what goes out in the world today lives out there for a dozen years. It's got to be tested against weather conditions in Colorado. It gets cold and it also gets a hundred degrees too. So you have to have all of those capabilities. So, yeah, so we're kind of, kind of excited about um, enabling this next generation of conversion to a new cable with all the same advantages of the architecture of the testing of all of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Pretty epic. I can't wait to use one of these. I, it sounds like you already have one installed at your headquarters with the NAX cable built in. Yep. Uh, so right where you are, which is awesome. I, I actually think I'll probably be out there next month. I want to come and charge on it and see how that whole thing goes. Um, what is, what are you finding station owners are wanting to do retrofit wise? Do you think we'll see this solution in the public in the short term? Or do you think station owners are going to wait for maybe another type of solution? Or what's what's the rollout of NAX going to look like? Because of course you own and operate some of your stations, especially here in Colorado, but then you also have a most, the majority of your business are, you know, separate wholly owned sites that aren't from you. You guys are just managing them and they're paying a service contract. Um, Yeah. So what's, what's going to happen? What, when will drivers see NAX cables? Yeah, I think they'll start to see them pretty quickly. Right. So I think, you know, I mean, to be honest, we are in the business. We're spending a lot of time. You thankfully are providing guidance to folks about how to think about things. But most of them are trying to be in the 
hamburger business or the or the creating software business or the whatever business. And so the time that they have to go through and think about what does this mean? How do I approach it? All of that is limited. So we're trying to provide, you know, the flexibility that allows them to not have to worry about it. Um, but I do think we've had for folks that are u- utilization driven, right, either leveraging LCFS credits or whatever it might be, uh, the NAX cable is a game changer, right? It opens up a whole new set of vehicles um, and simplifies the whole process, all that. So I think we'll see a lot in the CPO side of the equation. Uh, and then for uh, folks that is, you know, it's ancillary to their business, but drives new customers, they're going to want a great experience. And so inevitably, I think a lot of those folks will also come to us, right? Whether that's at a, you know, a convenience store or, a, you know, or a gas station or a, you know, a, a, a retailer or whatever, I think they're going to have to, they're going to get demand for this. Uh, Tesla drivers don't want to carry around an adapter unless they have to. So I think they'll see the, the shift and enable that. Um, so yeah, I think it'll happen. Um, the, I, I, again, I feel like the, the, while we're both excited about where this takes us in the long term, the bad news is for those that are the least educated, they have to start making decisions in the short term. So we're trying to take that and make that easy for them. Yeah, I love that. And you guys really are the direct interaction for the site hosts who don't want to host charging. They put the charger in so that they could get more customers for whatever they're, else they're selling or whatever business they have going on. So really good point. Something I hadn't thought about or even uh, communicated well enough to our audience. So we should do some topics around that. Um, to help, you know, at least make it easier for site hosts who may just Google, should I swap to a NAX port? We could help maybe with some data and work with you guys on that could be interesting. Um, you know, the, the last question, and it might be a great question for Hussein, but maybe you know this as well. Um, older Teslas from, let's say, 2021 and before can't actually charge on NACs without a charge port retrofit. Something because NACs speak CCS, the cars need to be CCS enabled. However, maybe you know this, is it possible f- to basically change the way your equipment interacts with the car so that older Teslas can still charge natively with that port? Or is it just going to be for new ones? Yeah, I, I think I know we're talking about that and working on this. I don't think we've drawn conclusions yet. Um, so I know there's a, you know, a team over across the street working on this right now. I don't know that the answer, and I don't know that it requires a software upgrade on the on the Tesla itself or on our unit or whatever the case might be. So I know they're working on it. Perhaps when you're out here in a couple of weeks, we can we can get Hussein and you together and, and have that conversation. Yeah, it would be great. But Michael, can't thank you enough for joining. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched our two hour long charge point, uh, you know, full video, there's so many views and I don't really care about the views. The retention on that video was insane. We have like 70 or 75% watch time on a two hour long video about how chargers are made. So there's way you, more we have to do. You said it was the, one of your favorite days in your video the other day. And, yep. and I, I, I ended that day, the two, at the end of the day, went on my wife and I said, that was one of the best days at ChargePoint. <laughs> yes, it was so much fun. And we got to show everyone behind the curtains. So like it just a great way to, I would say, uh, you know, open up the world to what, what charging is like. And when it's done well, you know, there's a lot of things with ChargePoint. You're a huge company. Not everything is perfect. You rely on site hosts to maintain their equipment. It's a huge, giant cruise ship. Not everything can be 100%, but it's pretty damn close. Like you guys are absolutely killing it. Love that you were first, one of the first to install a NAX connector in the country, um, you know, at your headquarters. So that was awesome that you guys are right on top of this. The automakers that you've partnered with, Mercedes and others, have already committed and you're going to be building infrastructure directly with them. We have a story coming in about a month's time from now on some of those topics. So can't wait to share that with our viewers. And Michael, thanks for joining. Really appreciate the time you took. My pleasure, Kyle. Great to see you again. Yep. Great. Well, thanks for everyone to uh, for watching and we'll see you on another one soon. Bye-bye.